5-8-8-T, the prosecutor versus Bujaidin Popovic et al. All right, I thank you so much. And again, once more, good morning to you. Um, uh, prosecution and defense. We uh, decided yesterday, uh, since there are too many of you, too many accused, too many defense counsel, uh, and they're usually a constant uh, appearance that will try and uh, uh, freshen up a little bit the procedure instead of going through uh, each one of the accused and then each uh, one of the defense uh, prosecution. What we will uh, do is I will just uh, um, I put one single question uh, asking uh, the accused if any of them uh, are not uh, able to uh, follow the proceedings in a language that they understand to stand up uh, now and at any time later on during the proceedings if it's the case of not receiving um, uh, interpretation. So I take it that uh, you all are. and. Uh, then uh, I will uh, not be asking for appearances, but you are expected from day to day that if there are any changes in the composition <coughs> of your respective teams, uh, to stand up and uh, make the relative announcement. Agreed? Right. Thank you, Mr. McCloskey. You've been abandoned by Mr. Nichols and uh, Yes, they're, of course, busy with uh, the next two witnesses, but Lada Shulyan is here today, and I will try to be here as much as I can unless I'm with a witness, uh, Mr. President. I thank you. I thank you so much. Your cooperation is much appreciated, Mr. McCloskey. So um, uh, I understand there is a statement that you would like uh, to uh, make. Uh, just very briefly, I discussed this with most counsel. Um, uh, yesterday, um, I know everyone has been reading in the press about a new potential mass grave from Srebrenica, allegedly the largest mass grave found, over a thousand bodies. Well, we looked into this, and this um, there appears to have been a mass grave that has been found. It does not have a thousand bodies. It appears to be what looks like the normal secondary grave and has uh, uh, probably a hundred and 40, 50 bodies, and many, many body parts. So information of this sort, as you can imagine, is very emotional and sometimes prone to exaggeration. So I just wanted to get that out. We will get more details on that, but I believe it is a secondary mass grave. It may be very well be one that is already incorporated into our evidence. And if, if not, we'll, we will incorporate it. But we'll have better information on that for you in the future, but I did not want anyone to, to think that there was another grave with over a thousand bodies out there. Um, that is not the case. Thank you. I thank you, Mr. McCloskey. Uh, I also understand that uh, the prosecution agrees with the way shown or indicated as uh, the defense of uh, defense preference for uh, the presentation or availability of. Uh, cross-examination documents? Yes, Mr. President, I, uh, we do. Okay, I thank you. So uh, we'll be proceeding with uh, later on in the day, hopefully, with uh, the relative uh, decision, which will be along the same lines uh, indicated uh, in the Milosevic uh, and the Milutinovic uh, decision. Last uh, but not least, uh, Madame Nikolic in particular, uh, I'm sure you are aware of the latest uh, filing uh, by the uh, prosecution in relation to uh, tomorrow's uh, witness. And I suppose uh, you have no special comments to uh, make because it more or less answers the uh, concern that you expressed uh, yesterday or the day before. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Is there any one of the defense teams that would like to address the uh, subject matter of this latest uh, prosecution filing? Details of which I'm not going into because of the confidentiality of the uh, motion. Okay, thank you. Again, ex please expect a decision on uh, those protective measures later on in the day today.
Yes, uh, Mr. Stoich. Good morning to you. You have the floor. And also the lector. Thank you and good morning, Mr. President, your honors. Uh, yesterday we left off discussing uh, several topics which we think are relevant and important to ultimately adjudicating the case as it relates to Mr. Beata. Uh, we spoke briefly about uh, collective guilt and how the Madam Prosecutor herself uh, Monday told us that it is not about collective guilt. In our opinion, it's easy to say something is not this and yet to try to prove your case through what we call the side or the back door. Uh, the prosecution, I think, tells us they don't believe in collective guilt, but continues to lump the accused and continues to argue down the road of collective guilt. Collect collective guilt, in our view, is nothing other than if you argue that specific intent follows you into your job. Genocide, as it is in this jurisprudence, does not subscribe to that view or that position. Specific intent doesn't follow you into a job. We'll see that that's the view of the prosecution, and we hope that the court recognizes that all it is is a substitution of a few words to actually talk about collective guilt, which they themselves reject and they themselves acknowledge is not part of the jurisprudence in this case. Yesterday we spoke a little about, a bit about Mr. Biera and his rank and how it maintained the same since 1995, 1985. I'd like today to begin, if I may, with the theory called tried and tested. Mr. Biera's case and the allegations against Mr. Microphone, please. Microphone, please. You covered microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Have, in our view, been tried and tested on at least two different occasions. The first occasion was during the Kirstich trial, when the defense of General Kirstich and his defense lawyers actually advocated an empty chair defense. In essence, in my jurisdiction, that is where they shift or try to shift the blame and responsibility to an accused who is not present. Any facts from that case which can be seen to be adverse to Mr. Beata should be looked at that he didn't have a right to cross-examine, didn't have a right to confront his witnesses, and obviously had lost his presumption of innocence since he was not present. However, despite those three rights that Mr. Beata has, Beata has, the prosecution in that case tirelessly and steadfastly argued against this theory called dual functional relationship where the defense there tried to shift the blame on the security officers and shift the blame on the staff officer of the security unit, namely Mr. Beata. The prosecution was successful and convinced the court, and rightfully so, that it was not the security staff officer who was responsible or culpable, but General Kerstich. That same theory was subsequently examined in the appellate court. And the appellate court, again, rightfully found that it was not Mr. Beata, it was General Kerstich. I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to apologize for objecting, but that is just uh, not yes. a fact. Neither the prosecution view nor the appellate court's view. Well, I think you are right. Uh, well, yeah. I'd like to expand, if I may, on that, Your Honor. And there's, if we look, if I may, Yes, go ahead. If, if we Stoich. look at the but please, please be precise because well, I think uh, what what Mr. McCloskey has interjected, having read uh, both decisions uh, myself, and, uh, and I will assume also my colleagues, um, uh, you're, you're not being precise. Thank you. I, I believe that I am precise with all due respect to the prosecutor. If we look at the second time the case was tried and tested, it was tried and tested in the Blagojevich case, where specifically Specifically, witnesses were brought in by the defense attorney, not by Mr. Blagojevich, because we know that history. They were brought in and they shifted the blame or tried to shift the blame on Mr. Beata. Specifically, those witnesses testified. They've now become ultimately and all of a sudden witnesses for the prosecution. 
We'll talk a little bit about those witnesses in a few minutes. However, in that same case, I submit respectfully to your honors that the court rejected that dual functional relationship where there's a parallel hierarchy or a parallel chain, rejected it. They found Mr. Blagojevich guilty. I'd like to inform the court that I dare say that Mr. Biera can hold a candle to Mr. Blagojevich, that he cannot hold a candle to Mr. Blagojevich. The evidence will show that Mr. Beata was a mere staff officer in the security unit, did not perpetrate, participate, or commit any of the crimes against them. We spoke a little bit about integrity, and if I'm going to play a tape with the court's permission, uh, if I may, and it's merely a five-minute tape, and just by way of background, I'm going to explain it. When we talk about integrity, I was proud of my colleague at the prosecution's office when he said that integrity is not a laughing matter and I don't want someone to poke fun at my integrity or to make a joke of my integrity. And then we proceed, that's the first section of the tape, which is about 30 seconds. I believe your honor's on it as well. The second section of the tape is from the September uh, closing argument of Blagojevich. And I asked this court to specifically listen carefully to the comments of the prosecution yesterday meaning in the Blagojevich trial, and today. It's a four minute tape and I would like to play it, especially in light of the objection that we just heard moments ago. So would the gentleman in the video booth please play the tape? Yes. Mikulski. This is a, a, Mr. a rather novel uh, approach um, and I would ob object uh, to this. Um, I think we all, the idea that my comments earlier in this trial are somehow relevant to an opening statement uh, is, uh, I, I don't think it is. Um, and I think having just not been able to give it much thought, but we need to, in this trial, be able to speak freely and not think that our, our comments are going to be televised again. I don't mind my comments being televised. You can televise my entire closing statement in, in the Blagojevich case, but I don't see the relevance of it, and um, and it, it uh, nor the point. Well, I, I wouldn't let the fact that uh, we are going to see a first section uh, referring to your statement um, uh, disturb you that much, because I wouldn't worry about it. But uh, on the other hand, I think. The whole purpose uh, of uh, this exercise is to uh, uh, put uh, this in juxtaposition with what you stated uh, in your opening state, uh, statement in this case, uh, contrasting it with uh, what, if I have understood Mr. Ostojic uh, well, contrasting it with what was the prosecution's position in Blagojevic. So let's let's uh, go through it first, and if it's not regular, then of course we'll stop it or, or reverse our decision. But for the time being, uh, I think we should uh, listen or look at what uh, is being proposed by Mr. Ostojic. Yes, Mr. McCloskey. Thank you, Your Honor. Understood. Uh, and on the point um, of discussing what the prosecution's position was uh, and what the court did in Blagojevich, um, well, we're very proud of what we did. Uh, and the, the, I know the decision of the court was uh, very carefully thought out. And we have um, used the law as we felt it allowed us to under judicial notice and adjudicated facts to bring that, that material to your attention. However, many of the conclusions and legal conclusions and theories of the court, um, uh, the law does not allow us to bring forward to you, and we have not. Um, that would be extremely prejudicial to many of these accused. Uh, and however, if this door becomes open, um, that uh, it may be, be then become relevant, though I certainly don't want to re-argue that case again. That, Anyway, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see after we've uh, gone through these uh, two videos or, or whatever they are. Mm. And uh, if it's necessary to give you the floor, Mr. McCloskey, we certainly will. Yes, Mr. Stoyevich. The gentleman in the video, thank you, Your Honor. Would the gentleman on, in the video booth please play the tape?
Is there anyone in the Trust video? <laughs> Mr. McCloskey, and then we will see. If we have reason Thank to uh, be strict uh, with the prosecutor, then we will do so. I, I won't make any comment about trusting prosecutors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. McCloskey, uh, any comment on that? I'm only receiving. Mr. Ostoyich. I would prefer her, her to come by me before she makes statements. Yeah. And if it's going to statements that are going to go to my uh, integrity, I don't ap appreciate jokes either. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCloskey. Um, Mr. Ostoyich. Yes, Mr. Ostoyich, I repeat. It, it what continues said. to play, Your Honor. Yeah. You, do you want to see more? Man yes, shame. yes. Now, the second portion, Your Honor, is, is playing game. now. If we can just team. start it again at that. Goyevich. That's the way it is. Chain. And I say third man. It's Mladic, Kerstic, Blagojevic. That's the way it is. Two generals and a colonel. We've got the MOOP, we've got others. These are the commanders. These are the key guys. Now we have Bayara, we have Popovich, we have Nikolic, we have Drago Nikolic. These guys are staff officers. One of the reasons they get charged with genocide is because staff officers in the security branch have chosen to be in the security branch and it's an ugly job and if you've chosen to be in that job specific intent is a follows you into that job in in the view of the prosecution but they are staff officers Colonel Bayara can't hold a candle to Colonel Blagojevich Colonel Bayara and we made this very clear because we do not want to suggest Dragan Jokic is the commander because there is a huge difference, a huge difference. A staff officer is an empty vessel and only has the power that is given to him by his commander. Bayara is, is nothing but a sicko, empty vessel until Mladic gives him those orders. He doesn't have the right to command troops. He doesn't have any troops. Same thing with Popovich. These guys, and I, I don't know how to communicate this to you, but in, a mili in the military context, they don't even go to the same function as the commanders do. They don't have the power, they have the authority, and you can see it. And, I'll, and I'll, if I get time, I'll point you out some of the examples. But that, you, you need, to, need to understand that, that they, it's the commanders are the ones that calls the shots. They're the ones that can make the difference. They're the ones that have the men. And especially in the brigades. Remember, the main staff has a protection regiment and the 10th Diversionary Unit. Protection regiments designed to protect on Piesach and other areas. The sabotage detachment is a sabotage mission to go in. They don't really have very many troops. The brigade is even, or the, the, the corps is even less. They have small MP squad, they've got you know, the 5th Engineers, they have a couple of other units that aren't really involved here. It's the brigade. The brigade has, he's got over 2,000 men under arms. He knows where the fuel is, he knows where the, the, the logistics bases are. They, you know, this is their home base. The brigade commanders are the key players in this. And they're, he's a colonel. He, he, I can't overstate that, 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 that principle, how important the brigade guys are. The brigade guys are the guys that are dying in the trenches, and it's the Blagojeviches of that war that are there to protect them and their town, to give you the, in the positive sense, not the Kerstiches and the Mladiches and the others. So as a commander with honor is the man that takes the blame when things are bad and gets the blame when things are good. War crimes go down, they have to take it the same way. We can't just put it on the evil staff officers. Yes. I, I believe it stops there. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there are a couple points that in our opening statement we would like to at least address with respect to 
the comments made in the last two days, and I think in other cases, there are more, obviously, and we don't want to waste our time by splicing them and showing them to the court. But I think it's important when we talk on Monday or last month about integrity and when we talk about presenting to the court certain things that we maintain that honor and that we continue to tell the court, yes, we're offended when someone attacks our credibility, our integrity and our reputation, but we must also work, in my view, hard to maintain that level of trust. I promise this court that what I say in my opening statement with respect to Mr. Beata, we will bring forth the evidence regarding the September uh, 1992 incident. We will bring the prosecutor, hopefully, and or the judge. Similarly, we'll bring in the articles and ex explain to the court the September 1993. However, I believe that the same standard should be held to the prosecutor and even more so, and that is because they carry the burden of proof. And that burden of proof should not, and their theory of the case should not change from day to day, from witness to witness. Our client, Mr. Beata, is entitled to a trial on his own, on his own merits, not because of the joinder, but because the facts as they stay. The prosecutor cannot in one courtroom suggest, in our view, that someone else is to blame and come in this courtroom and tell us that another person is to blame. He himself, we believe, and the evidence will show that you cannot blame the evil staff officers. Why he believes they're evil, hopefully he'll bring forth that evidence. Uh, we believe that you cannot blame the staff officers. We believe that there is no evidence for there to be blame attributed to the staff officers. Also, the prosecutor suggests that the orders may flow down. There is no such thing in any criminal jurisprudence or any military army that a nod or a wink authorizes someone to carry forth orders. The prosecutor a couple years ago suggested that Mladic gave an order to Mr. Beata. Where's the evidence? Did we see it yesterday that he presented in his binder for Mr. Beata? No. Trust me on this. There is no evidence <coughs> that General Mladic gave <coughs> Mr. Beata orders to kill or to transfer any of the Bosnian Muslims in Srebrenica in 1995. Their best witness who will come here has a slightly different version, again, depending on the day that he testifies as to purportedly who may have given Mr. Beata some instructions. We hope that you'll find this witness, or as he comes, although Mr. McCloskey calls some of his own witnesses, I think he used the word bald-faced liars, we hope that you'll find this witness's testimony less than credible, and I believe that it is not believable, and we'll get into that a little later. Uh, tried and tested, I honestly believe it has been. The prosecutor could have easily said that we believe whatever the defense says in those cases, they may be correct, but we have enough <coughs> evidence on Blagojevich. They chose not to. They chose to tell the court what their theory of genocide is, specifically when they mentioned specific intent relating to the staff officers in the security unit. They said it flows with the job. Mr. Beata was a staff officer, and Mr. Beata was working as in a security, in the security unit, 10 years at the very least prior to Srebrenica. Did it follow him in 1985? It does not hold water that they can suggest other than with one exception. And that's the exception that the Madam Prosecutor told us she will not because it does not exist, and that is collective guilt. So our view is if you must look at the evidence specifically for Mr. Biera, take what they've done, and they've worked on this case for well over eight years, now 10. They've examined all the facts, the documents, the intercepts, the witnesses. And two years ago, they tell this honorable court, not specifically your honors, but an honorable court at this tribunal, that it flows. Specific intent flows to people. We suggest that the evidence will show that it does not flow. And we suggest that they cannot meet their burden of proof. And we suggest that there was no specific intent as it relates to Mr. Beata at any time 
relating all the incidents, all the tragedy, all the massacres that occurred in Srebrenica in 1995. Tried and tested, we'll hear from many witnesses who have testified, who have been cross-examined, who have been put on redirect, given multiple witness statements. All this has been done, and I've tried to give you a snippet of what the prosecution's theory really is against these mere staff officers. I challenged them, as I expect to be challenged, that when they say General Mladic gave an order, that they can prove it. It's not my job to tell this court that he didn't or to prove somehow by calling him. It's their job then to tell the court when we made that comment it was erroneous or we don't have the proof to substantiate that claim. There is no witness, there is no intercept, there is no document to suggest, infer, much less determine or establish that General Mladic gave Mr. Beata any orders, specifically orders to kill or to massacre. It just doesn't exist. He says that Mr. Beata cannot hold a candle to Colonel Blagojevich. His words, although I used them before I played the tape, those are his words. That should remain true if we have integrity and honesty throughout the process, not to pick and choose and to elevate an accused, but it should be maintained throughout the entire process. That's what integrity is. That's what character is, in my view. And that's what we hope to establish for the court throughout these proceedings. We will not, unfortunately, be able to share this with the court early in the trial because it is a lengthy trial. We know that the court will continue to maintain objectivity and wait until all the evidence is in before you render a decision. And I say it most respectfully. But it may be difficult when someone continues to press forward with a theory that we believe may be inadequate, improper, unsubstantiated by law, and wait a year for us to come back and try to rebut or refute or contradict that theory. Therefore, we chose to give an opening statement this time in order just not to let a year pass by, in order to address these very concrete issues up front with the court. We will, in our case, hopefully specifically not only contradict, but rebut the evidence that the prosecution claims to have against Mr. Beata. My next section that I would like to discuss with your honors is something the Madam Prosecutor said on Monday, and she's right. Or I uh, strike that, she is right, but she said it July 14th of this year. And I'm not sure if it was taken in the transcripts, but I heard it, and I don't think it's, it's uh, necessary to check the transcript for this. She, when we objected to her giving uh, her statement, part of her opening statement, uh, she stood up and said, facts, just facts. It's a great phrase, facts, just facts. I've listened to her opening statement on Monday. I've heard conclusions. She concluded that there was genocide. She concluded who, were, who was mostly culpable in her view. The prosecutor likewise leaped to conclusions in our view. Those weren't facts. Those were conclusions. Your honors respectfully will come up with the conclusions only after we provide you with the necessary facts so that you may be fully informed. And that's our job. And I promise you that we will give you the facts which in our view will exonerate Mr. Beata. What are those facts, just facts? We touched upon a few of them. yesterday, late in the afternoon. Uh, we believe that if the court respectfully looks at those facts properly, objectively and honestly, Mr. Biera will be found not guilty. Those facts, some are not in dispute. Some may not be in dispute. And yet, others are. What are those facts? That he was not only a staff officer, but in the words of the prosecution, merely a staff officer. Mr. Biera, that's a critical fact. 
that Mr. Vieira had no military personnel to control, <laughs> direct, or command. That also is a fact that cannot be rebutted or contradicted. That Lubisha Beara was not a member of, quote, an inner circle, end quote. The word inner circle, I believe, was coined by the prosecutor in their pretrial brief. And if your honors would like, I could get you the page specifically. I'm confident that it's in there. It's significant to say that Mr. Beata was not a member of an inner circle, because the prosecution alleges there are participants in this inner circle. Separate trial for Mr. Beata, he is not a member of the inner circle. By their silence, not now, of course, but in their brief, by not saying Mr. Beata was in this inner circle, they're clearly telling us he was not a member of the inner circle. I yesterday discussed to you about Mr. Beata's promotion. I failed to mention it's not just a promotion from his rank of colonel or before that when he was a Navy captain in a battleship prior to 1985, but it is in fact he was never decorated never awarded medals. That's relevant. That's relevant to the theory of the defense and the facts in this case which are undisputed to show his detachment, to show his isolation, if you will, during the events of Srebrenica in 1995. Mr. Beata did not have the authority to command or to direct subordinate military troops or personnel. Mr. Vieira did not have the power to command or direct military personnel, subordinate or otherwise. Another critical fact, we saw pictures, we're going to see I'm confident videos. Did Mr. Beata participate in what the prosecution will try to share with you are important or relevant meetings? The evidence will show quite plainly, quite objectively, quite unanimously, he did not participate in any relevant or important meetings. He did not attend, nor was he invited to any such important meetings. You might be wondering, although you may know respectfully, what are some of those meetings? Well, the prosecutor touched on it a little bit yesterday. The Hotel Fontana meeting on July 11th and 12th of 1995. Those are facts. When we look at those videos, with respect to Mr. Beata, he was not present. He did not participate. There was never an invitation. And there's no evidence to suggest that he was informed of the contents of the meetings that occurred. Three meetings. Not one. The other discussion, I believe the prosecutor touched on it, there was a meeting immediately prior to the third meeting at the Hotel Fontana, at the Hotel Fontana, uh, with the non-UN and Dutch personnel. Uh, that was in the morning of July 12, 1995. Again, Mr. Beata was not invited, did not participate, and there is no evidence to suggest or infer <coughs> that he was informed of the contents of that meeting. Mr. Beata's lack of attendance and lack of participation, in our view, confirms his lack of knowledge in the purported crimes that occurred in Srebrenica in 1995. His lack of participation, his lack of attendance confirms not only his lack of knowledge about the crimes, but his lack of knowledge of any purported plan orchestrated by others if such a plan even existed. The prosecutor in its briefs and it's in its indictment suggests that the plan is something that was a moving target. He suggests that it started as early as 1992 <coughs> and he goes on and then develops it. The manifestation of this purported plan, which I submit to you, there was none not my burden of proof, but I submit to you that there was no plan 
as the prosecutor says, to commit genocide by any of the VRS members. And most definitely, there was no plan that was ever shared, communicated to, or informed to, to Mr. Beata. The prosecution, I think, says that Mr. Beata was an empty vessel, an empty vessel isolated on an abandoned ship in the middle of sea. He's telling us two years ago, after eight years of research, eight years of witnesses, eight years of working, and I believe, as Mr. Ruiz will share with us next week or when he testifies, that there are two people in Mr. Ruiz's view who know the Srebrenica case better than anyone. Obviously, the self-serving Mr. Rua says it is himself, and also his superior, Mr. McCloskey. After eight years at that time, after an additional two years of working this case, Mr. McCloskey again calls him an empty vessel. An empty vessel because he was merely a staff officer, did not participate in any meetings. We agree. The only thing quite candidly at this point that we disagree with is that they come up with this vague General Mladic gave some orders. There is no evidence to that. Mr. Beata was never and had never had authority vested in him expressed or implied by any commander had never had any responsibility for the handling of the Bosnian Muslim prisoners taken or captured after the fall of the Srebrenica enclave. Mr. Beata had no power or authority to organize, to facilitate, to coordinate, or to transport any of the Bosnian Muslims after the fall of the Srebrenica enclave. Mr. Beata also had no power or authority to supervise or oversee any of the Bosnian Muslim prisoners captured or taken after the fall of the Srebrenica enclave. It's significant when the prosecutor tells us that he's an empty vessel. It's significant when the prosecutor tells us that Mr. Beata cannot hold a candle Mr. Blagojevich. It's significant when we look at the evidence and view each document, how does it fit against or in favor of Mr. Baada? I suggest that the documents where he's not mentioned, where he doesn't appear, plainly and simply put, exonerate Mr. Baada because of his, he was not participating, he was not present, and there's no evidence, as the prosecutor said, a day or so ago, linking him together. They call their chapter three the evidence to link. He does claim to have some rather, or a few intercepts. We've touched on a couple. I invite the court, obviously, respectfully, I know you will, look at those intercepts carefully. He talked about an intercept where Beata's name was mentioned with respect to Mr. Popovich. Mr. Popovich, in his discussion, as we'll recall, is telling, supposedly, Mr. Kerstich, they won't let us in, they won't give us access. There's not only more than one reasonable explanation or view on those purported facts, but there are multiple. And this jurisprudence suggests that if the inference can be reasonable in favor of the accused, then that's the reasonable interpretation that we're required and mandated to take. I suggest to you there is a specific, reasonable explanation for the intercepts. I must again stress the intercepts for two reasons. We hope to call an expert relating to the intercepts to explain specifically the me mechanism that goes be behind the scenes of taking down such information. We believe this court will find that the intercepts should not be allowed, that this court will find that the intercepts are not worthy of the credibility necessary for a criminal trial proceeding and will reject most, if not all, of the intercepted conversations. Respectfully, I know I'm speculating, but I believe that our expert will confirm 
the flaws in the intercept analysis. And that's what I expect our evidence to show. Facts, just facts. I have to keep reminding myself that because the man and prosecutor uh, said it and then sometimes we as lawyers do turn a corner or go on another theory. The fact of the matter is that there are going to be multiple witnesses that testify, as your honors know. I've tried to categorize these witnesses into certain groups and subgroups. One category of witnesses that I found easier to follow, and I'll share it with the court, if I may, and that is the court, the group called insiders. It's a fact that there are witnesses, and I think the prosecutor used the word, uh, insiders. My view is there, there are two subgroups to these witnesses called insiders. One, one, one moment, you switched off your mic. Thank you. When I make one little move, it all falls apart. <coughs> the first subgroup of these witnesses called insiders are those witnesses who believe the ends justify the means. In essence, they have a result, and their entire task is to work towards ultimately obtaining, creating, manufacturing, evidence to get that result. The ends do not justify the means, although there are witnesses that you'll find believe that that is actually accurate. Who are those witnesses by way of brief example? There are many, but because of the limited nature of the time, I'll highlight some. I believe one of them is Mr. Ruiz. Mr. Ruiz says that he was one of the first investigators to go to Srebrenica, and he's worked on it for eight years. Mr. Ru has never attempted to get what we believe are critical information, Sorry. critical information from the security branch, critical information such as Mr. Bada's daily required notes to examine fully what his participation, if any, was, but merely concluded as the Madam Prosecutor did in her opening. Mr. Rua, as you'll find, is not an expert. His investigation is nothing more, most respectfully, than a one-sided view of the prosecutor's case, having been the senior investigator for the prosecutor. His view is totally for collective guilt. And we hope that that will be borne out. Another witness who comes to mind, which is in this category of the ends justify the means, by way of example, is the insider known or previously known as the OTP military analyst, Richard Butler. The evidence will show, I believe, that Mr. Butler left the United Nations and this tribunal and now works for a government which abuses POWs and ignores the international laws governing human rights. In our view, it says a lot about someone and someone's character and integrity when they claim one day to fight for human rights and to protect human rights, and then the next day they work for a government who abuses such rights. Our military... One, one moment, Mr. Rostovich. Please, if you want to confront uh, Mr. Butler with this, you do it when he is present. But please don't do it in his absence. Well, and if I may, with the most respect, Your Honor, with the most respect, I agree with you. But I wish that there was a court when Mr. McCloskey called my client a derogatory word two years ago that someone would also suggest to him not to make a comment like the word sicko unless he can confront us with that in a courthouse. We are dealing with Mr. Butler. Fair enough, Your Honor. Okay. Our military expert will expose Mr. Butler's flaws, as did the appellate court in the Kirstich trial. Those are facts where he works, just facts. The second group or subgroup of insiders are witnesses who utilize information as a commodity, merchandise, which they sell or share for a reduction in their prison sentence that they may receive 
as a result of their own culpability. These witnesses, if, am I permitted to name them, Your Honor? Although I won't attack them, but I just want to who they are, provided we are not contravening any uh, uh, protective measure that no, has no, already been they're, in they're place, open. put in place by another trial chamber. <clears throat> you may proceed, but uh, I, I don't know who you're going to refer to, and I uh, consequently am not in a position to say whether they are protected witnesses in other, in other proceedings. Fair enough. I don't know. I, I believe that they're uh, witnesses who are well known and are testified openly. Uh, these witnesses, who are those that And for them, in our view, truth is a meaningless concept. For Mr. Beata and our defense team, we suggest that truth has no marketplace and that you cannot share or you cannot change, alter, manufacture the truth. The truth yesterday should likewise be the same as today. Our integrity, our character is on the line as well. The prosecutor yesterday, or the day before, I think it was Monday, said he has a witness that is a bold-faced liar, but there's some of his testimony that we believe we can use and is credible. I don't understand that concept. I honestly, I don't. Some of these witnesses that you will hear, if they're liars or bold-faced liars, should be rejected in whole. We can't pick and choose as the prosecutor, I believe, will do, certain aspects in order to fulfill our burden of proof. If that witness is honestly a bold-faced liar as identified by the prosecutor, charge him with perjury. If he's a bold-faced liar, don't ruin your own credibility and call such a witness. These witnesses who I call are salesmen of this commodity and information and merchandise not only lie, they commit perjury, they manipulate evidence, they solicit others to corroborate their own lies with more lies. You'll see from these specific witnesses and some whom I've mentioned that they not only will solicit others to corroborate their lies, but they will also obtain from documents information in order to corroborate their lies with more lies. I suggest respectfully that their testimony needs to be fully ventilated. Full ventilation is not possible unless all the notes, all the tapes, all the transcripts, both in prison and with the office of the prosecutor in their office when they discussed it, be something that is tender to the defense and to your honors so that we could see the full picture. Every letter that any of these witnesses receive from the prosecutor should be given to us to see if in those letters they've asked about and invited them to testify or hinted to them to testify against any accused. Obviously with the underlying, we believe, suggestion that if you help here, we will help you there. One witness comes to mind drastically. <clears throat> Pardon me. Mr. Deronich. Mr. Deronich uh, admitted it.
sorry for that interruption, Mr. Stoyich, but we needed to discuss something. Please go ahead. You were addressing Mr. Deronich again. Mr. Deronich, in our view, Your Honor, you'll see, and I think it's in one of the exhibits, uh, his plea agreement. He pled uh, guilty, I believe, to crimes involving Srebrenica, but not in 1995. He pled guilty to crimes involved in Srebrenica three years earlier, I believe, in 1992. Uh, we talk about. Uh, I was in that case. He, yes. Oh. Uh, okay. Thank the you. the uh, agreed facts okay. contained in the plea agreement do not refer to 1995. No, they, they refer to May uh, 1992. Yes. Uh, uh, 8th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and then 12th of May. Uh, and uh, the events um, uh, that preceded the takeover of Srebrenica in April and after, but not beyond that. Ex okay. Thank you, Your Honor, and I respectfully, I think I agree, and I, I know I agree because that's what I said. Uh, they don't apply to 1995, his guilty plea, and he here's what <laughs> troubles us and troubles witnesses who we consider are witnesses who uh, give information or use information as a commodity. Uh, that witness in particular, if there was anyone vested with authority, vested with power, vested with the ability to control or alter the situation in Srebrenica in 1995, our view is the evidence will show that it was Mr. Dernic. He got a written, expressed, explicit order and direction from Mr. Karadzic telling him he's in charge of the civilian and military and in charge to protect the civilians of Srebrenica. The prosecutor has made a decision not to charge someone in Srebrenica, or they haven't thus far. They're calling him as a witness. Your Honor, that's an, another misstatement of the facts. Mr. Derenich is not put in charge of the military. Well, as I said, Your Honor, I, if I may respond, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, but uh, Your Honor, I, I, I am thought, familiar with the, with the I facts thought of those the guidelines cases. were. I thought that the guidelines were that we don't object, as I didn't, to Mr. McCloskey's opening. I object to a lot and almost everything he said in his opening. It's my integrity on the line. I will bring forth the document to the court. I want to be held accountable to that, as I want them to be as well. There is evidence. Yes, go, go ahead. Thank and you. We'll deal with the Ronich when, uh, when the time comes. But do, please do remember that he uh, pleaded guilty to uh, the attack on Glogova uh, and only that. Yes, I, and I do remember that. But I think if the court will look at his participation relative to Mr. Beata's participation in 1995 or lack of participation, his attendance at meetings in 1995 and Mr. Beata's lack of attendance in 1995, I think the picture becomes more clear. There's another category of witnesses that I believe we'll see during the trial of this case, and there are what I call finger pointers. Uh, it's kind of an awkward word, but finger pointers are, in essence, uh, people or witnesses who point the finger of guilt. And they'll come up to this stand, and I think from reading some of their statements and the transcripts in other cases, what they in essence do is they shift the responsibility that was placed on them. They shift the ultimate culpability that they are exposed to, and ultimately their criminal responsibility that attaches with both their position, both their involvement, their attendance, participation, and presence during the crimes of Srebrenica in 1995. These finger pointers are probably the same people as those who sell information and sell what they call facts as a commodity. It is similar to when we discuss the lack of participation and lack of attendance at the Hotel Fontana meeting. Carefully, if you listen to that evidence, you'll find that witnesses have a varying view of how things occurred, when they occurred, especially Mr. Nikolic, who as early as July 12th purportedly heard or saw Mr. Karadzic make a gesture, I mean Mr. Mlad, General Mladic, excuse me, make a gesture that all the Muslims should be killed. Then you compare that to another witness who points the finger at 
an accused such as Mr. Beata, and he says he came secretly, inebriated or intoxicated late at night, and he shared with me that he got some purported orders from above. Those witnesses, these finger pointers, and we will try to examine this with the court's permission, we'll examine first their ultimate involvement, first their ultimate responsibility, and then see how credible they are when they try to attack or attach or include others in the prosecutor's web that they seem to be weaving of collective guilt. The finger pointers are quick to implicate and solely for the purpose of concealing and disguising their own criminal responsibility. The fact of the matter is, is that Mr. Beata did not become vested with any power or authority from any commander at any time and was detached from the battlefield activities, if I can use that military phrase, that regrettably occurred in Srebrenica in 1995. The evidence will show through both our witnesses and the prosecutor's witnesses that Mr. Beata at all times was not involved and had no knowledge of the purported plan, the implementation of the plan, or the crimes that occurred. He was not promoted. He was not in the inner circle. He was not in attendance at any relevant meetings. He had no command, no control, and no authority. There is no explicit or expressed order, direction, or communication vesting Mr. Beata with any such authority. The evidence will show that the fact of the matter is, is that Mr. Beata was helpless. The evidence will show that he was as helpless as the UN Dutch personnel who were present, who were on the scene, who saw what happened, who viewed what happened from time to time, but could not and did not prevent, stop, or deter the horrific crimes that were occurring. In several articles, I've heard this term, empty vessel, and they refer to people just like the UN Dutch Battalion or the UN Dutch personnel who were there but unable, with an inability, to do anything to prevent such a crime. We believe that Mr. Biera was just as helpless. Given his upbringing, his past education, his work experience, his altercations with the Serbs and the Serbian political aspect in 92, 93, and also you'll hear what happened in August of 1995, August 16th specifically, and we'll get to that evidence, but in the view of time, I'm summarizing it for you, that Mr. Biera, given that all those things, given the lack of any documentation, intercepts, or witnesses, credible witnesses, honest witnesses, witnesses who don't have something to sell, who don't have anything to gain, that it is not a wonder why Mr. Beata was helpless, powerless, and without authority. Mr. Beata, in our view, and the evidence will prove, is not guilty. I tried to highlight, and we're going to call a military expert, as I said. I want to ex expose what it means not to be able to hold a candle to Mr. Blagojevic. I know my time is running short. I want to be kept to our agreement, and I appreciate you for listening. I want to expose and also further explain or try to discuss with the court throughout this trial what this empty vessel means. Those are their words, not ours. I want to expose the fact that there are no documentation, intercepts, or witnesses other than those that are incredible, meaning lack credibility in my view, and most respectfully, when they implicate or finger point or actually 
claim that the ends justify the means. We will try to show this court in about a year or so, I'm not sure what the schedule is, specifically that evidence with respect to Mr. Beata. I appreciate your patience with me. I appreciate and have the confidence, the utmost confidence respectfully that this court will wait before they make a decision and not listen to one-sided evidence before they ultimately review that. I, I know you know your responsibilities. I'm, I'm saying it perhaps for my benefit more than others. Hold us to what we say in this courtroom. Hold the prosecutor that their view is that specific intent flows with your job. It doesn't exist. Hold him when he says that Mr. Beata can't hold a candle to Mr. Blagojevich. Hold us to the promises that I've made to you with respect to some of our witnesses and some of the evidence that I hope we'll share with you in the next coming months. On behalf of Mr. Beata and our defense team, we thank you for listening and we look forward to presenting our case to you in the future. Thank okay, you. Okay, one, one question before you sit down, uh, Mr. Stoyich. You uh, very a few a minute ago or two, uh, you made reference to some event uh, going back to August 16, 1995. Uh, what uh, event are you referring to particularly? Because I don't think you uh, yes. gave us an indication of what that is all about. Thank you, Your Honor, and it's a great question. I wanted to pique everyone's curiosity, like the September or the 1992 and 93 event. In, 19, uh, in 1995, specifically, August 16, 1995, there's some evidence to suggest, the document in particular, that uh, Mr. Beata sent to the Supreme Military Court asking that they appoint specific investigators and deputy prosecutors to investigate certain uh, war crimes or prisoners that were held who were ultimately going to be, tr going to be transferred to Focha. I was going to share with you specifically the details of those three meetings and how in one meeting uh, the UN, I think, witnesses will also say that General Mladic ordered, ordered that, uh, war, that the prisoners that were captured, the military prisoners, those who participated with the ABA, BIH, that they be interrogated for war crimes. That act, actually, and part of our defense is shows that, in fact, there was activity that people were put down on a list, people were interrogated, people were investigated. We think that all comes to a whole for the defense. Now the prosecution promised you something also. They said there is no evidence that anyone was interrogated. We're going to call a Dutch witness, we believe, who will tell the court contrary. He saw it, he observed it, he even participated in it during the critical time period. I didn't think it was necessary to share every aspect, but quite frankly, I can, I think, and we will. But this is a critical thing. So what we're trying to show before, during, and after, and I think it's an enormously relevant document, okay. a document that should not be ignored by the prosecution as well. All right. I thank you, Mr. Stoich. Thank you. Uh, I thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stoich. I now give the floor to um, uh, the uh, defense team for uh, uh, Mr. Nikolic. Mr. Bougon. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, judges. Good, good morning to you. We'll have a break at, at 10.30. Uh, Mr. That's President, if I can suggest that we have a break right now, I need just to do a, yes, a little certainly. technical setup and change seat because certainly. I have a presentation. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Certainly. President. So we'll have a 20-minute break uh, starting from now. Thank you. All rise for a